Hello, and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. It's the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre and tries to find an answer. Hello, Caroline. Hey. It's been a little while since we took a walk down True Crime Avenue. Oh, yes. The, it's the bad part of town. Oh, the rain's falling hard. The newspapers are blowing down the uh, the alleyways like mm-hmm. tumbleweeds. Mm-hmm. You see a, a little bit of a saxophone coming out. And finally, we come to Crime Alley. This is where Batman's parents died. <laughs> oh, the very same. Um, it is a true crime episode. It's a serial killer this week, Caroline, mm. that I've prepared for you here. Um. What do you know about Herb Baumeister? I don't know much. Um, that means you have very much in common with uh, Herb's wife, Julie. Oh. Before um, the search of their property in 1996. Yes. The only thing I know about him really, well, the only things that I know about him are from an episode of ghost adventures i believe our old favorite pals (laughs) where they um yelled at um bones ghost yeah you know as you do Mm -hmm. did a stick figure sit on anyone's lap or we gotta watch that one again it's been a long time it might predate the stick figures it (laughs) might they might not have had stick figure technology (laughs) when they covered baumeister um herb baumeister is known as indiana's worst serial killer Mm. While he was never brought to trial, the, um, you know, somewhat successful, well-known locally, uh, he was a well-known local business owner who killed at least 11 men in the early 1990s, uh, and police believe he may have killed as many as a dozen more. Jeez. All men? All men, yeah. Wow. Um, Herb was one of the variety of serial killers who, um, while living an outward Family life is is has a secret double life as a uh, as a killer that his family knows nothing about. Um, he BTK also, type a BTK type. Uh, he also um, was like, unfortunately, I think a lot of gay men in the nineties and eighties um, living a double life in the sense of going out to gay clubs and hooking up with men um, when his family wasn't around. Sure, but let's be clear, uh, killing people, not acceptable, not understandable, not okay. Yes. Just because you have, you're, you're, you know, trying to express your sexuality and you're repressed, it doesn't mean you're allowed to kill people. No, I'm just saying there was, there were a lot of ur- urges that Herb Baumeister was repressing mm. uh, for a lot of his life. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's start at the end of this story. Oh, Um, That's different. Because throughout the early 1990s, the Marion County Sheriff's Department and the Indianapolis Police had been investigating the disappearances of Indianapolis gay men of a similar height, weight, and age profile. They tended to be tall um, and in shape. This is kind of around the time of Jeffrey Dahmer, right? Um, Yes. Is this after? It is after. Okay, but they were probably operating around the same time at a certain point. Uh, It could be. We'll get into Herb's timeline uh, a little later on. Mm -hmm. Um, But the police were, unfortunately, listen, uh, at the time, police were a little bit slow to investigate this as compared to if it was a bunch of um, co-eds disappearing or something like that. Mm Mm-hmm. And um, even among the gay community, there was a little bit of a a feeling of, I mean, number one, exhaustion, because they dealt with um, AIDS in the 80s. And then um, there was another serial killer in the Ohio area who had um, just been caught and killed um, like a few years before. Uh, So it was just exhaustion. And also uh, there was an element of like older, more conservative uh, gay folks going... Well, these guys are getting what they, uh, what's coming to them um, out there cruising for strange. Everybody knows that's dangerous. Stop doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. And I think there's also a, an element of the less dead syndrome. A hundred percent. Certainly not as much as, uh, say, certain people of color or things like that, indigenous people. Homeless uh, people. Yeah. But um, 
like in the case of John Wayne Gacy, that's a little bit earlier than this. He's also a, a repressed gay man killing uh, young men, presumably. Um, and a lot of the stuff that happened there was, you know, oh, these are kind of transient kind of guys. They're They're not really sticking around. Maybe they're, you know, they hitchhiked their way out of here or something. People aren't really checking up on them as much. Yeah, um, absolutely. But the police... Even the police had to, uh, you know, start taking this seriously after, again, 10 gay men in Indianapolis had disappeared between April of 93 and August of 95. Wow. Those were all between the ages of 20 and 46, but they especially tended to be in the 20s and low 30s. Um, in August of 1994, a 26-year-old Tony Harris contacted police and um, now, we are working from the book Where the Bodies Are Buried by Fanny Weinstein and Melinda Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, so we thank them for their uh, research. It, it's packaged because it's a little paperback thing um, and written like, um, I don't know, like a, like a pacey, exciting detective story kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, just a little bit of true crime journalism history. I think in the 80s and 90s, you get a lot of these mass market paperbacks uh, written very quickly after certain crimes to kind of capitalize on the public interest in them. I always find them at thrift stores and true crime sections. Um, and sometimes, you know, they end up being some of the only main sources that actually go and talk to witnesses and stuff because a lot of these crimes, kind of like the the John Dale Cavaness one, they don't end up being as heavily covered. Right. So, you know, they're not always the most rigidly journalistic or whatever, but um, they're definitely a perspective of as it's happening, as the investigation is happening. I was going to say, this one uh, definitely feels written by someone who wanted to write novels. Mm. Um, which isn't to say I don't trust the facts in here. It's just, um, you know, the descriptions are descriptive. <laughs> um, so Tony Harris is described as six foot seven, uh, very athletic and with a mop of brown hair. I picture kind of comedian Gary Goleman. <laughs> okay. Um, although some of Tony's dialogue and uh, actions in these stories uh, had me, like eventually I turned him into a Brian Quinn from Impractical Jokers in my head. So, Interesting. So he lives somewhere in that wheelhouse. Okay. Um, Tony contacted police claiming that he had met a guy at a gay bar in town calling himself Brian Smart and that Brian had killed Tony's friend, uh, Roger Allen Goodlett, and tried to kill Tony as part of an erotic asphyxiation game. Oh. There will be a lot of discussion of erotic asphyxiation in this episode <laughs> great <laughs> and especially in the next couple of minutes well again it's another john wayne gacy thing he used to choke people and tell them it was a trick that he was doing and it was a trick just not the one that he was uh, claiming it to be yeah well there are shades of that here but uh, here listen to tony's story sure tony says he stopped in at the gay club 501 tavern for last call and noticed this guy brian he said he was a guy he had seen around before. Um, he had a baby face, he said, but but looked aged from too much like fake tanning. Like oh. his skin was a little leathery. Yeah, I've, I, see, I saw the picture of her Baumeister on the cover of the book that you were reading. And he that's exactly like a weirdly aged baby face. Yeah. Yeah. Like a child star that grew up real fast. What do you think of John Mulaney? God, that tall child looks terrible. <laughs> kind of. Um. When Tony saw him, this fellow was looking at a missing poster for Roger Allen Goodlett, age 33, a uh, gay man who had gone missing uh, a few weeks before who was a regular in the club scene. Um, Goodlett was a friend of Tony's, and so when Tony saw him uh, staring at this poster, he walked over to, uh, to this gentleman who he said he'd seen around before, and he thought he might have seen the same guy with roger goodlett a few weeks before mm. and so tony walks up and says have you seen him <laughs> the man said he was 28 years old but uh tony didn't buy that for a second um he said his arms and chest were covered in a um 
very short stubble, like as if he had shaved all of it but a few days ago, or if he had burned the hair off for some reason or somehow. Okay. Um, Fashion-wise, he said he looked like, quote, an Indiana Republican. Okay. So, I don't know, red tie, sport coat. Yeah, I assume like a suit or something. Um, This man introduced himself as Brian Smart, said he was a contractor from out of town, and um, he said, well, hey, why don't we go back to the place I'm staying at and have a swim? It's got an indoor pool. I do remember this from the Ghost Adventures episode. <laughs> That sounded good to Tony, and uh, while Brian tried to get Tony to follow in his car, Tony insisted on getting in Brian's car and letting him drive. Hmm. Now, you're a woman uh, who could be put in... I mean, you're a married woman, uh, but, <laughs> w- you know... I would absolutely not get in the car. I w- the The idea of him insisting on that is weird to me. I would definitely bring my own car if it was... I mean, I wouldn't be doing this, but let's say it was someone I kind of knew and we were going on a date or something. I would definitely take my own car. Um, Tony said that he felt safer later, said that he felt safer with the reminder of his existence that his car would be left in the parking lot of the bar. So if he disappeared, people would know he had been there. So is he doing this as like an investigation? Uh, Partially, I think so. Because... If I had any inkling of that, I wouldn't be going. But, I mean, if he's if he's Veronica Marsing it and kind of putting himself in harm's way to, to investigate, then I, I guess I get it. He also, look, I don't know Tony's lifestyle, and I'm not a gay man now or a gay man in the 80s and 90s in the club scene in Indianapolis, so I shouldn't speak on this. Um, but you're a white man, so you will. <laughs> I'll only offer that maybe... You know, maybe Tony's situations for hookups have been a little sketchy in the past as well, and it's gone okay. Yeah. But he's careful, at least in the Tony Harris kind of way. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So he felt safer leaving his own car behind. He said that this Brian character actually almost insisted, no, you should take your car. That way, if you want to leave, you'll have it. And that almost seems suspicious to Tony. And almost. He really insisted that Brian drive. Okay. They drove for a while, drove out of town, and Tony said he got that feeling where you look out the window and go like, oh, this is, we're going to a really nice, this is really rich people country. Um, as they left town and went into kind of a, um, not even a suburb, but like, you know, large estates kind of set back from the road. They pulled onto one of these large estates. Brian said there was a sign. You could only see the word farm as they pulled past. Mm. So this is like a Westport, kind of. Um, I would say... Like a Southport? No, the closest thing we have... The closest thing would be, you know how in Greenwich, the really expensive houses are away from town... In the woods. Yes. There's no woods here. Because they have a lot of property. Yeah. There's no woods here, but that's what this is. Okay. Brian took Tony through, they parked the car, and then Brian took Tony through a cluttered, unlit garage. He apologized, but promised there was power in the basement, where he took him next. Um, In the basement, there was more clutter. Tony mentioned specifically two TVs, one flat screen and one older like, you know, fat TV, mm-hmm. um, which was moved away from the wall and unplugged. Um, there was a wet bar with a mannequin standing behind it. We'll get back to the mannequin in a second. That's a no from me, dog. And an indoor pool, as promised. Um, yeah, the mannequin is weird. There was one mannequin in women's clothing behind the bar, um, like it was serving drinks. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then there were two other male nude mannequins lounging by the pool. Absolutely not. No. Tony asked three mannequin. That's three too many mannequins for a house. Tony asked Brian about the mannequins and Brian said, I get lonely out here. Absolutely not. I don't like to be alone. Which Tony immediately thought was weird because Brian said he was only staying at the house and he lived out of town. Mm -hmm. When did you have time to bring these mannequins in, buddy? Mm -hmm. Um, Brian offered Tony cocaine at this point. Um, But Tony... Said he wasn't interested and offered Brian the joint that uh, he had brought instead. So they smoked that. Uh, Brian fixed Tony a drink and offered him the use of the bathroom. Tony says he went to the bathroom and poured his drink down the, down the sink and filled it with water. 
Mm-hmm. It was a clear drink, so okay, worked out okay. Um, when he was done with the water, Brian offered him more liquor. He's going, come on, Tony, it's a party, let's party. And he was kind of pissy when Tony wouldn't take another drink. In fact, Tony said he got surly for several minutes, like a, you know, oh, fine, you don't want to have a good time? Fine. And he marched out of the room. Um... And then, like, one minute later, came back, bubbly, full of energy, and talking a mile a minute. Mm. Which Tony figured meant he had just gone out and done a couple of bumps of coke. Probably. And um, at this point, Brian keeps telling Tony to get in the pool. Come on, get in the pool! Get in the pool! Get in the pool! You should get in the pool. The pool's fun. Get in the pool. He's not getting in the pool. Mm -mm. He's just telling Tony to get in the pool. And he'd also turned the heat up at some point, because it was like 95 degrees. So Tony finally gets in the pool. And then Brian picks up a hose and says, hey, I just learned this really neat trick. No, this is John Wayne Gacy. 100%. Uh, He proceeded to tell Tony how great it felt to choke someone while having sex. Oh, God. Remember, Tony's floating in the pool and Brian's sitting on the side of the pool. And he wraps the hose around Tony's neck and goes, you want to (sighs) try? So if if you've you wouldn't let yourself get in this deep, but if you're here, what do you do? Uh, Tony's made so many choices that I wouldn't make. Yeah, because I I would have my car. I think he'll regret. The I car would thing see too. the mannequins and turn around immediately. Um, I'm I'm proud of him for not drinking the drink. Uh, I mean, at this point, I would probably swim away. (laughs) Um, What Tony did was reach behind himself, pull Brian into the pool, and start punching him in the face. That's fair enough. As And Tony screaming, You fucking pervert! You sicko psychopath! You killed Alan, didn't you? Dang. So now his suspicions come out. They've been bubbling under the surface the whole time. Um, He then choked Brian. With the hose or just... Just manually. You know, he's in the pool. He pulls him into the pool and he's choking him until his lips uh, turned blue. Um, And then he let go of him like, I don't want to kill this guy. Brian floated to the bottom, sank to the bottom of the pool. And when he came up, he was smiling and laughing. And he he goes, wow, you could have killed me, but that was so cool. It was such a rush. But you're supposed to hold me above water when I lose consciousness. Oh, my God. Uh, Now, inexplicably, Tony still stays in the room as Brian shows him how to pinch the cardioid arteries on either side of the neck. And then Brian pulls a sofa bed out and gives him a tie so that Tony can strangle him while he touches himself. No. Yep. And Tony goes along with the whole the whole show. Tony. Tony. Anthony. While he's uh, while they're working on that, Brian they're also they're working on that. Brian also told Tony uh, that people are never so beautiful as when you're choking the life out of them. And this is a direct quote: "Their lips change color. That's how you can tell it's working." <laughs> and their eyes. Uh, they then switched places. Um, Tony, <laughs> come and uh... Tony now stroking. Well, Brian uh, tied the tie around his neck. And Tony said he passed out, he fake passed out on purpose to see what Brian would do. And he got like real scared and called out Tony's name and shook him. And then Tony just goes, is that what happened to Alan? Jesus, just get out of there somehow. After this, the two went to sleep on the sofa bed. And Tony got up to look at Brian's wallet. Um, but as he was fishing it out of the pants, he said, Brian like shifted in his sleep and he got scared. So he dropped the wallet. Um, and then he had to make it look like he was doing something. So he like (laughs) wandered around the room and then he realized the guy wasn't waking up. So he decided to take a, take a peek around upstairs. He went upstairs, got a phone and called his sister to tell her, uh, where he was just in case. Okay. Thank God. This went bad. (laughs) But then he goes back to bed. He doesn't have his car there. The following morning, Brian said he had to pick up some papers and that he would be back in a bit. Feel free to go back to sleep or whatever. So he leaves and Tony immediately starts creeping around the house. He said there was very little furniture in the house, 
but it was full of cobwebs. He kept repeatedly referencing the cobwebs. Um, he said there was a fully decorated Christmas tree in what must have been a sparsely decorated family room. Mm -hmm. And the carpets were all new, but had a thin layer of dust as if someone was remodeling. Um, upstairs, there were a couple of bedrooms. The cleanest one had two twin beds, so it looked like a child's room. But he said the closet was full of tripods and video equipment. Ugh. He went into another bedroom. And it was uh, it had women's clothes and purses in it. And Tony said he thought, oh, is this... Now, this prejudices of the time, even for Tony, who's a, yeah. who's a gay man. He was like, oh, is this guy a cross-dresser or something? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't put it past him. That's what the book has, <laughs> Tony thinking you're literally still here tony so i wouldn't put it past him um and then brian came back home and brought tony to his car okay tony um shared this whole story with police including the description um but of course he didn't have brian's real name didn't have the location of the house and didn't really have any other um information that would prove useful including whether this man actually had killed this goodlit fella I don't know. You could probably narrow it down. You could tell how long, you know, about how long it was out of town, minute-wise. How many of these places have an indoor pool? And it had it had farm in the name. Well, it sounds like police told him to basically keep an eye out for this guy. If you see this character around again, get some um, information, a license plate, a real name, something. Um, otherwise, take a hike. There's nothing we can do with this. I mean, they could have done something, but... Well, Tony stayed vigilant, and potentially more vigilant than the police they were still investigating in August of 1995, when, on the 29th, Tony was at The Varsity, another uh, gay club in town, when who should walk in but Brian Smart. Uh, Tony jumped up, uh, he, he grabbed his buddies and said, look, it's that guy that killed Alan. And so Tony came up with a great plan. He said, I'll distract him while well, you go and get his license plate number. Now, I don't know why anyone needed to distract Brian. No, just, just go outside. <laughs> just go outside and get his little plate. Um, but instead, Tony stands up and goes, Hey, guys, look! Come and shake the hand of the guy who's been killing all these guys! Strangling them! Come on, Brian, old boy! Yeah, show me that <laughs> trick you showed me where you put the hands right here. Isn't that right, Brian? Uh, oh, my God. To a man he believes to be a serial killer. Oh, my God. Herb... Because this is Herb Baumeister mm -hmm. we're talking about. Um, looked at him, not angry, not laughing, just totally seriously. Uh, it's more like this, actually. Putting his hands uh, to the sides of Tony's neck. You pinch it just enough to shut off the oxygen to the brain. And then turning to kind of address the assembled crowd, he went, It's such a rush. A pedantic madman. Wild. Oh, my God. Uh, meanwhile, Tony's buddy was getting the license plate to the car, and he passed it along to the police. Um, and police detective, I, I think the detective on this case was named Mary Wilson. Um, she identified Herb Baumeister, drove, it o drove over to his estate, and compared it to the hand-drawn map that Tony uh, had drawn for her. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looked like a match. The name of the estate that Herb Baumeister lived at was Fox Hollow Farm. And when she called the neighbors, the detective confirmed that, why, yes, uh, Mr. Baumeister does have a pool in the basement. Why do you ask? Does he also have three creepy mannequins? Um, I can tell you for sure that he does. <laughs> um, and that's how the police finally got a hold or finally got their sights set on Herb Baumeister. Um but it would be a little while before they were allowed to actually search the property. And, well, you and I don't really know Herb yet. So uh, after the break, I'm going to circle back and fill in the details of uh, the, I don't know, the shell of idyllic suburban existence that hid this monster for maybe over a decade. Oh, jeez. After the break. <laughs> Welcome back. When last we left you, we set the scene for the investigation into Herb Baumeister, Indiana's worst serial killer. 
Um, I told you about the rash of disappearances of gay men in Indianapolis in the early 90s. And I told you the story of one Tony Harris who um, had an encounter with this would-be killer and got escaped with his life. <laughs> Most of the men who went on dates with her Baumeister, it sounds like, weren't so lucky. But who is her Baumeister? Baumeister was born April 7th, 1947, to an anesthesiologist father, who was still in medical school when Herb was born, um, but soon moved up to be practicing at Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis. It's the biggest hospital in town. Mm -hmm. Herb had a fairly idyllic upbringing, it sounds like. He had a sister and two brothers. They said they played lots of wiffle ball and tag around the neighborhood with the other kids. Um, although little Herbie's favorite activity was weather club, it's a thing he invented and moderated, <laughs> where each member selected a geographic region of the United States and reported on the weather there. Mm -hmm. So that's future serial killer stuff, <laughs> if ever I've heard it. Sure. That is dangerous. <laughs> um, at college, Herb met his future wife, Julie, who would describe him as nice, fun to be with, and good looking. Julie especially liked Herb's decorating sense. Uh, tell me what you think. He wouldn't uh, hang cobwebs. <laughs> he wouldn't hang posters on his walls like other, uh, like a, a normal college student. He would like find hubcaps in junkyards and staple them to um, burlap and hang that up like it was art. And whatever floats your boat, Julie. That's cool. <laughs> um, and Julie said we both liked cars, and we were both young Republicans. Mm. Great. Um, the two of them, after graduation, pretty quickly got engaged and then married and threw themselves into homemaking as a team. Um, neighbors said they had the best looking house on the block, especially with Herb's uh, Christmas light displays. I guess he was like Clark Griswold-esque about uh, covering the house and friggin' Christmas lights and the lawn and everything. Mm -hmm. um, he was actually very, very per a perfectionist about many things in his life, not tidying up the house, apparently. Um, but just about everything else. That might have served him well at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, where he got a job in 1972, and he, st he would stay there until 85, working up to program director along the way. Um, meanwhile, Julie was teaching English and journalism at Broad Ripple High School until she had three kids and uh, became a stay-at-home mom. Their kids were Marnie, born in 1979, Eric, born 1981, and Emily, born 1984. Uh, not all was well for Herb, especially mentally. Um, his Bureau of Motor, Motor Vehicles co-workers always said that Herb would act kind of funny, uh, talking to himself, uh, weird tics, that kind of thing. Um, and shortly after starting at that job, uh, and shortly after his wedding to Julie, Herb had a nervous breakdown, and his father actually had him committed to Carter Memorial Hospital for two months. Hmm. Um, Julie claims that this was over a car repair. Well, a lot of these, they're always last straws, you know. Yeah. Um, and listen, maybe he wasn't socially adept. Uh, maybe he he was he had some problems, but. You know, nothing, nothing to this point sounds like serial killer stuff. I mean, he could be mentally ill and, you know, whatever. Um, no, yeah. It doesn't, you know, even being committed, people, people like, uh, they have nervous breakdowns. Um, I think we could all understand where, where that comes from after the last couple of years, but. A hundred percent. Where does it turn to darkness? Right. Uh, we'll we'll get there. Um, on the car incident, Julie said he was coming home from Bloomington and three or four cars hit him. Um, and after he found out the car was a total, Herb sat for several days on our apartment floor crying. Mm. Several days. Um, after leaving the BMV in 85, Herb was between jobs for like a year. The family was really struggling for money. And Julie was wanting to get back out there now that the kids were a little bit older, and so the Baumeisters went into business together, um, opening a chain of thrift stores. Where did they get the money for that? Um, you need capital, right? Well, they lived on savings and part-time jobs for three years while they set the money aside. Mm -hmm. um, they got a big old loan from the bank, and they opened Thrift Management Incorporated and their first Save-A-Lot thrift store, 
um, on 46th Street in uh, Indianapolis in 1988, my the year of my birth. <laughs> well, uh, it was for you, Sean. Julie thought this would be a perfect job for Herb, who was a rabid collector, who was always at garage sales and estate sales and secondhand stores anyway, just for no reason. And like literally he would pick through dumpsters as well if he, if he saw something that he liked. So Herb took right to the secondhand wares business. He obviously had a nose and an eye for it. And uh, the family had opened a second store by 1990. And in 1991, they moved uh, from the house in the suburbs of Indy that they were living in to Fox Hollow Farm, um, an 18-acre estate outside of Westfield, Indiana. So this must have been very profitable pretty quickly. Um. Yes and no. I think that Herb was a guy who liked to spend money Mm. and definitely was at every point here stretching the family's, I'm not going to say budget because they didn't have one, stretching the family's means to their absolute utmost. Mm. Um, Because he would also, he bought the the kids go-karts. Um, he bought a boat at one point, he bought himself nice cars, uh, he took the family on vacations, uh, until they bought the house, the big expensive house, um, because with money sunk into that and sunk into the business, money was pretty tight for a little while there. Mm -hmm. He still, I think the boat and the go-kart both came after this, (laughs) but family vacations had to slow way down. After they moved into the house, which they well, could... Why don't you... You could just go downstairs to your pool if you want to, you know, they couldn't, have a nice swim somewhere. Well, they couldn't really afford to fill the house with furniture because <laughs> it was so big. <laughs> um, so it was kind of tough and, and, and the kind of place that you might like to get away from every once in a while. And so Julie and the kids would head to the family's condo on Lake Wawasee um, whenever they could. And sometimes they would head out during the week and Herb would wait and join them on the weekend. You know, so Julie and the kids might make a week of it. They go out Wednesday. Um, Herb works the rest of the week, joins them Friday, um, comes back out, comes back out to the farm on Sunday. And then, you know, the wife and kids stay another couple days, Mm -hmm. Um, which gave Herb plenty of time to get work done around the house or murder. Mm -hmm. Now behind the curtain, Things weren't as idyllic as they might have looked to outsiders looking in at this apparently, um, you know, very successful, loving, um, normal family. Well, I can sense a hint of overcompensation. Yeah. Well, maybe some of that is that Julie says in 25 years of marriage, she and Herb had had sex maybe a half dozen times. Wow. A half dozen. And she says... She didn't think about this till after they were divorced, but she never once saw him nude. That's so weird. What? Yeah, she never He's saw him. He's a never nude? She never saw him completely naked. So they well, had no, sex like... T- Tony Harris did see him completely naked, right. so he's not a never nude. But his so... wife, uh, yeah, never saw his whole body at the same time. So they had sex like six times, and he has a 50% accuracy rate because three of those times resulted in children. Apparently, yeah. So the his his in boys are swimmers. In five years. Good Lord. Yeah. Um, she was, like, did she say anything? Like, she couldn't have thought it was normal. Here's the thing. She actually said she wasn't talking to other women about their sex lives. And uh, Herb, it sounds like, kept her pretty isolated in general. She wasn't talking to a lot of other people, period. But especially, she wasn't talking to any women who she was close enough to to ask them about their sex life and vice versa. Um, She says, and this seems bizarre to me, but she says she didn't know it was abnormal. She would have liked to have sex with her husband more. (laughs) I mean, you know, she probably didn't have much experience. Again, you, you said that she didn't have many people to talk to. So yeah, maybe she did think that. I feel like all media is working to to tell you that's not normal, but, you know, I mean, maybe she had a a low sex drive herself, so she was kind of relieved. It could be. Um, Herb definitely did, like, try to isolate her groups of friends and from friends and family uh, every chance he could. And uh, while he wasn't a, like, he doesn't sound, he wasn't a violent guy to her or to the kids, Um, he doesn't seem like a very violent guy in general in that i think anyone could kick his ass in a fight you know what i mean 
Um, it's interesting that he would want to isolate her. You would think that her being out of the house or her being distracted with friends or whatever would be a bonus to someone living a double life. I think it all goes back into the perfection, mm. perfectionist angle of Herb. He needs the wife and the kids to be doing exactly what he thinks they're supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and he would, uh, he would say he's emotionally manipulative, not, not physically abusive. Uh, soon after they were married, she said, so this must've been sometime after the nervous breakdown. Um, Julie said Herb got mad at her over something and moved to an upstairs apartment in their house and didn't speak to her for a year. What? Shortly after their marriage. And you just, you just stay. I mean, uh, I guess. Well, once you have kids, some people are like, you know, now I'm stuck. Did they have kids at that point? No, you're right. Not one year into the marriage. (sighs) Damn. Um, Not all was as well as it seemed with the couple's business either. Um, Their business lawyers have uh, later said... And Julie has later said um, there were a, a series of bad business decisions, but right from the beginning, the stores were both in bad locations, and they had really bad deals with their landlords. And so, um, between the charitable giving the stores did, part of the store's charter was that they were um, connected, you know, like Salvation Army or something. Mm-hmm. They were connected to a um, local children's charity, um, which they gave like a million dollars to over the life of this business. Um but they just weren't generating enough profit to uh, support certainly all of the expenditures of this family. Yeah. And uh, so that led to more fighting between uh, Herb and Julie, of course. And actually in February 1991, just before they moved into their new 18-acre estate at Fox Hollow, Herb moved out and filed for divorce. Uh, Several weeks later, he had a change of heart and moved back in, but that's where the family was at. Yikes. Yeah. Big yikes. And uh, all this time, Herb was apparently going out and cruising and every now and then killing a guy. Either by accident or... Like, was he always strangling them in this kind of choking game he would do? Or did he kill them other ways? Uh, I believe all, if not virtually all, of his victims had a uh, broken hyoid bone in the in the neck that would indicate probably they were strangled strangled Mm. um that's the ones that complete uh corpses were found for more on that later yikes in fall of 1994 because caroline we're you might be wondering what what he does with what do you do with bodies after you what does a herb baumeister do with bodies after he kills them Mm -hmm. um in fall of 1994, we maybe, maybe Julie got a hint at, at the answer there, although she didn't suspect it at the time. 13-year-old Eric was uh, playing with a friend behind the house when they found a human skull. Oh, boy. Um, naturally, the boys did what any boys would do. Um, they put it on top of a stick and ran home to scare Eric's sister with it. <laughs> Um, but Julie caught them running around with this skull and said, what the hell is that? And uh, they, sh- they she made her show the spot where they found it, and there were more bones scattered on the ground. And then she called the police? No, she asked her husband about it. And he said? Oh, they, you know what, those, that's, those bones are obviously, they're, that's from this old skeleton that my father used to have. Uh, when he was in medical school, because he's an anesthesiologist. Honey, you remember? My dad's an anesthesiologist. And why is the skeleton in the backyard? Oh, uh, raccoons must have dragged it out. From where? The garage. Julie. Julie, Julie, Julie. Julie felt a little weird about it, so several days a later... A little? Several days later, she was thinking about it, and she was like, ah, I just want to take another look, and she returned to the spot, and the bones were all gone, so she just never thought about it again. Okay. Now, how much of that, I don't know, how much of the, is she? That's crazy to me. Right. How much of it is turning a blind, are you turning a blind eye at that point? Well, I mean, I have no idea what her perspective is. 
if she's just completely believing him for some reason or if there is a, a sense of oh something's bad here but I'm going to ignore it um because I'm afraid of what'll happen if I don't ignore it right but there has to be something there has to be something there because that's nuts well it wasn't until the next year in August of 1995 that Tony Harris led police around to Mr. Baumeister and Police then approached first Herb and then Julie to ask about searching the property. Uh, Neither one of them was on board with the idea. Why? What was Julie's problem with it? Well, she just thought there was no way that her husband, she thought her husband wasn't a murderer. Okay, so let them search the property and prove it. I agree. Oh, they also, when they asked Julie if they could search the property, they told her that Herb was cruising gay clubs. Mm Mm-hmm. Which... The police uh, seemed, and Julie says she didn't know uh, until that moment, so she was dealing with a lot. She had no sense he was gay? Apparently. That's what she says. Okay. That's what she says. So Herb and Julie both refused to let police search the estate. But tensions were running hot inside the family. Obviously. Um, In November... John Egloff, this is a couple months later, because the police, they haven't been given permission to search. What can they do? They don't have enough information to get a warrant, apparently, or Mary's superiors didn't feel she had enough to get a warrant. And um, so they were going to need permission. So they did a flyover at one point. Ask one of the kids or something. (laughs) They they did a helicopter flyover. Like, can you see any bones? Stop. Um, Really? Oh, boy. In November, John Egloff, who was the couple's business lawyer, got a call from Herb in which Herb said he'd reached the end. This is quoting Egloff now. He said there was no way the business was going to survive and that he couldn't stand up to see he couldn't stand to see everything he'd worked so hard for taken apart in a bankruptcy. He said that five minutes after he hung up the phone, he wouldn't be here anymore. And what did the lawyer do? The lawyer tried to, as the lawyer tried to answer, Herb went, I know what you're going to say. You've been a good friend, and I expect you to try to talk me out of this, but my mind's made up. I've thought about this, and it's best for Julie and the kids. Uh, He then went into a rambling stream of consciousness rant, Herb says. No, John says. Yeah. In which Herb said, quote, this isn't a quote because it's hearsay from John, I guess, but. Uh, Herb said something to the effect of, oh, one other thing. There's this guy who's stalking me. I woke up one night and he was trying to strangle me. I hope he doesn't come after Julie and the kids. After he got off the phone, the lawyer immediately called the sheriff's department, who sent a car over to check on Herb. And Herb was pissed at um, what the lawyer. So he was still alive? Yeah, he said five minutes. He was taking he was taking his time. Well, maybe they got over there real quick. But here's my question about the when he says there's a guy stalking me, he tried to strangle me. I wonder if he's do you think he's considering annihilating his family at that point? Oh, that's interesting. Like he's trying to leave some kind of he's gonna kill his wife and kids and then kill himself and make it and, and... either that or maybe he's trying to make it like whatever's being said about him it's this other guy right you know the one-armed man syndrome right but if he doesn't die that's going to fall apart when he goes to court well that i mean he he would have had to kill himself after that (laughs) which he didn't do so right right bad plan herb well he doesn't seem like much of a planner Uh, herb and julie were still running the business but uh their emotional especially herb's emotional state was uh pretty out of whack as you can imagine he was already a fussy perfectionist and now a hot te- hot tempered nightmare at work. Um, and five employees quit Save a Lot within three weeks after. Um, he wasn't committed after that. After what? After threatening to kill himself. No. No, because usually the, you would get at least like an involuntary. He just said the lawyer was lying. He said, "No, I did talk to John. I don't know what would have given him the impression I was going to kill myself." Just everything about you, Herm. (laughs) Just everything. (laughs) You just seem like a guy who should. (laughs) It just seems like your vibe. 
By January 1996, Julie had filed for divorce. Oh, thank God, Julie. It's not totally clear if she was convinced uh, by the word getting around about Herb's, you know, murder spree. Um, or if, I don't know. Or if the, you know, the couple's relationship, which had already been pretty fraught, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Things probably got a lot worse under the police investigation. So whether or not she believed in Herb, um, she did that. And by June 1996, five months later, um, she was ready for the police to search her property. Mm. Why'd she wait that long? I don't know. She said that that's how long it took for it to sink in. Like she was like, even though I decided I couldn't be with this man, I still couldn't believe the father of my children. Da, 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 da. Um, it could be that. The timing, though, does coincide with Herb taking Eric on a vacation to uh, Canada, which Julie wanted him to come back from, and he wasn't coming back. And then Herb suddenly signed the kids up for a six-week military camp in Culver, Indiana, over the summer, which uh, Julie was not cool with, but she couldn't get her lawyer to get Herb to cool it. And so her next call was to police (laughs) to let them search her property. Fair enough. Um, and then she's it, it, the impression the police give is then she's got the police on the phone and she's like, Oh, and by the way, I forgot. Uh, my son did find a skull a couple summers back. <laughs> it's so crazy. Um, so police got their butts out there. Uh, luckily, of course, Herb was on vacation with his son. And so police, uh, searching the property found a burn pile where a trash can or something had been for, for a fire. Um, with many complete bones and burned bone fragments um, behind the house. And as they wandered the property, they said there were just bones all over the place. Just scattered like confetti? One of the sheriffs was like, I I was walking around going like, all right, well, what are we going to be looking for? And (laughs) And then somebody pointed it out to me, and then I realized everywhere you looked, there were bones. Like, it was just littered with bones. So, so how would he dispose of the bodies did he bury them at all and then animals dug them up or uh there are a lot of remaining questions about herb's um methodology because um, well for reasons that that we'll get into um but what police found on the day were nearly six thousand bones teeth and fragments of bones um in fact they were still searching and still finding fragments into 1997 um And then started, of course, the arduous process of, like a jigsaw puzzle, um, putting these skeletons together and trying trying to to identify people. Because at first, police were hoping they were just looking at animal bones. Of course. Uh, In almost all cases, they were human. In all, the police uh, sorted those bones into 11 men's bodies. Eight of them could be identified. They were John Lee Bayer... Richard Douglas Hamilton, uh, both age 20, Stephen S. Hale, 26, Alan Wayne Broussard, 28, Jeffrey A. Jones, 31, Manuel Resendez, 31, Michael Frederick Kiern, 46, and Roger Allen Goodlett, 33. Mm -hmm. That's Tony Harris's buddy. As I said, Baumeister was on vacation at the time. But Julie wanted her kid away from her husband as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, So police executed an emergency custody order and took Eric without telling Tony about the search. Sorry, Tony. Without telling Herb about the search. It's for the best, yeah. Um, After his son was taken away from him, Herb kind of figured the jig was up and fled to Ontario. Mm -hmm. And on July 2nd, he called and asked to speak to each one of the kids. He wouldn't say where he was. Uh, He... Uh, pretty specifically said uh, that he loved them and goodbye on the phone with each of the children. And then he went to Pinery Provincial Park on Lake Huron, Ontario, sat uh, facing the lake and shot himself in the head. He was wearing gray slacks, a white button-down dress shirt, and a red and blue striped tie because he was an Indiana Republican to the end. Uh, On Herb's person was an envelope reading, Attention Canadian Authorities, Uh, inside of which was a rambling three-page suicide note written, uh, scrawled, really, on yellow lined paper. 
Um, it's weird. His perfectionism breaks down at the end here. Um, the suicide note described his failing marriage and business um, as the reasons for his suicide and makes no mention at all of the 11 men whose corpses were found in his backyard. Good riddance. Good riddance indeed. It would have been nice to see uh, Baumeister brought to justice for his crimes. Of course, of course. But there's just about no lonelier end than the one he got. And as we know about Herb, he hates to be alone. Mm Mm-hmm. Kind of an interesting postscript or prescript to the Herb Baumeister story. Um, during the period Herb was active, police were still investigating the murders of the I-70 Strangler. This was a murderer who had killed 12 gay men in Indiana and Ohio between June of 1980 and October 1991. And he was a strangler. And he was a strangler. Interesting. This guy's first victim was Michael Petrie, a 15-year-old boy. Um, who was already known as a regular prostitute in Indianapolis's gay clubs. The same gay clubs that we know Herb Baumeister would be hanging out in, um, at least certainly a few years later. Uh, Petrie was found naked by the road in rural Hamilton County, Indiana. Um, he was strangled with no drugs or alcohol in his system. Um, Eleven more would follow. All regulars in the local nightclub scene or prostitutes, all men, and ranging from maybe age 14 to maybe age 42. Hmm. Now, this is very interesting because in February of 1998, after Herb was uh, dead, after her, you know the news about Herb came out, I was going to say after he was arrested, but he never was, of course. Um, an Indianapolis resident told police that Baumeister had been seen leaving the Vogue Theater with strangler victim Michael Riley. So the story on this Riley kid from back in the 80s had always been people had seen a stranger leaving this club with him. Um, Mm. February 1998, police got a tip that that stranger was Herb Baumeister. Uh, From that tip forward, he has been the police's number one suspect in the I-70 strangler killings as well. Um, For the record, Julie, his ex-wife, says Herb... Knew Ohio's back roads very well. Some of the victims were found, you know, on the side of the road in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Um, And Herb uh, knew those roads from years of antique hunting and visited (laughs) Ohio, quote, dozens of times in the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, he would have been 33 years old in 1980 when the first strangler victim was found. So that's pretty prime serial killer age. How old are you again? Um, The age of the Lord plus one. (laughs) Um, and the M.O., as you pointed out, Carrie, is the same. Wait, you're not 34. Wasn't, yet. Wasn't Jesus 32? No. I thought he was 33. Oh. Was that Alexander? Alexander. I was just making a point that you're the same age as her Baumeister. When he potentially killed his first victim. Yeah, well, you said it's prime serial killing age. Prime. So it's a joke. No, I got you. <laughs> I promise I'm not going to murder anyone. No. Don't be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, I believe you. Um, the MO is the same, of course, for Herb Baumeister and the I-70 Strangler. As you mentioned, the, the strangling, um, all those snapped cardioid bones. Um, and finally, the Strangler wasn't caught, but more or less stopped having victims be found right around 1990-91 in the same time when Herb Baumeister bought that house. And started burying bodies behind it. So I, I think it's pretty, pretty good. It, it fits pretty well. Pretty compelling, unifying theory there. Uh, he very well could have been just dumping, dumping his victims until he bought that big house. Yeah. Um, and it also seems maybe a little unlikely that uh, a guy, a monster like Herb Baumeister would have fought the urge into his 40s. And then suddenly started killing after he bought the house. Yeah. And if he's doing a lot of this antiquing and all that stuff alone, I mean, he has plenty of time and opportunity to do it, to to kill people along the highway. Now, as for what his burial method was or why those bones are so scattered or whatever. Just laying out in the open? We really don't know. I mean, now you know why we don't know anything else about Herb's process, sure. right? The police didn't get to interview him. He shot himself in the head. Um, so all they've got is the 
I know that at one point police uncovered like a ditch while they were searching that had been covered over that had a bunch of bones in it. So I think he would fill a pit up, you know, and then dig a new pit. But he would maybe bury, he would burn the bodies first and then bury the bones. It doesn't seem like uh, he was digging very deep either. Maybe some of that stuff came back up. Yeah. Weather and animals, all that stuff. For sure. He seems like a perfectionist, but also a very lazy man. And there's all always this kind of vibe of vaguely wanting to be caught. Well, how do you mean? Oh, you mean with putting the... With a lot of serial killers, you know, at a certain point. The careless burial is a uh, an invitation? Yeah, and, you know, the, the reaction in the bar when Tony Harris comes up to him and is like, you killed him, and he's like, this is how you really choke a guy. Like, it's just weird. That was when I was picturing... Um... Brian Quinn, by the way, was when he's going, oh, look at this guy. <laughs> so we're just casting this with all comedians, I guess. Well, no, because the, he, that was the same guy was Gary Goleman and Brian Quinn. Yeah, but also vaguely John Mulaney as her Baumeister. What? Why? Because you said he looks like a tall child. Uh, yeah, but that's just a John Mulaney <laughs> bit. I don't think he looks like John Mulaney. If okay. anything, his, his face is round. Mulaney's a long skinny. <laughs> okay. So that's the uh, story of Herb Baumeister. Carrie, where um, where does that fall for you among serial killers in terms of, uh, not, not your favorite, but uh, in, <laughs> in terms of the horror, in terms of the interest of the story? What, what do you think? What do you I think mean, of old it's, Herb? It's definitely fascinating. I find so many parallels with Jeffrey Dahmer and with John Wayne Gacy, uh, who are both more well-known, but maybe not more prolific uh, if he was also the I-70 strangler. I think the the not knowing maybe has left a lot open, and that's why he's not as well-known. Uh, but it's it's pretty fascinating, I think. It's kind of the epitome of just the wolf in sheep's clothing and how everyone around you has secrets and some might be dark. I think Gacy killed like like over 20, over 30 people. I don't know if it was over. It was definitely around 30 at least. But, you know, if he's also this strangler, then uh, if Baumeister is also this strangler, then he killed over 20 people. Over so. 20. Might be more than Dahmer. I don't know. I, I don't have the stats on me right now, shockingly. I'm just saying, Gacy ran out of room under the house. Yeah, and he wasn't even going to the backyard. <laughs> That's just underneath. Hey, talk about la- talk about the lazy. I mean, at it's least for Bal- the- <laughs> at least Baumeister's getting into the backyard. Listen, it's for the best, okay? That he got lazy. We don't want him killing more people. Um. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's a, an interesting story. I'm definitely going to go back and look in that Ghost Adventures episode. Maybe we'll do a mini-sode on Patreon about that. Oh, fun! The haunted, uh, haunting of Fox Hollow Farm. But, yeah, uh, thank you for bringing another lesser-known true crime case to us. Always happy to do it. And, um, listener, stick around for a little bit of news. And uh, we'll also be tickling your ear with a little bit of fresh Patreon content this week, so um, be on the lookout. Tickling your ear. Let's take a trip to the Bizarre Bazaar. Ah, we're finally back. (laughs) Smell those spices in the air. Spices or bones? What? Archaeologists helping to excavate the future route of a high-speed railway line at Fleet Marston near Buckinghamshire, England, discovered 425 bodies in a late Roman-era cemetery. And 40 of these bodies were found to be beheaded. Sweet! Vampires? (laughs) Yes, a total of 10% of the bodies uncovered were decapitated with their heads, now skulls obviously, placed between their legs or next to their feet. Wait, so they were vampires? Well, one interpretation that archaeologists say is that they could have been criminals or some kind of outcasts, although decapitation, decapitation was a, quote, normal, albeit marginal, burial rite during the late Roman period. Or... 
they could be Roman vampires. Yes! <laughs> Hundreds of items were also found at the site, including lead weights, spoons, pins, brooches, gaming dice, which look very much like our own six-sided dice, uh, bells, and over 1,200 coins. All of these suggest the area was one of trade and commerce, with gambling and religious activity also taking place there as well. Cool. So I thought this was an appropriate story uh, for for bones in the backyard, so to speak. So they just bury the vampires right in the middle of the casino? <laughs> if, if, if your theory checks out, yes. The site dates back to the Roman occupation of Britain, which we were just watching a YouTube video about because we were very, very interesting people. And that was between 43 CE and 410 CE. Yeah, I will say the head between the legs might have been, I think it was like a German or Romanian tradition. So not that For it could, vampires. Yeah, not that it couldn't have come down from ancient Rome to, to them, but uh, I don't know. Let's just assume they're vampires. Okay, let's just, let's assume they're vampires. All right, vampires. When in doubt. That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary. And check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain'titscary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify now. We'll be forever grateful. Yes, uh, we will indeed be forever grateful. Um, hey, Patreon's a great way to support us and we'll support you right back. We are going to have a lot of content coming there very soon uh, for the next couple of weeks starting, oh, what, today, tomorrow? When is that going to be up? Starting today or tomorrow. Close you can, to the weekend, probably. This weekend, you can hear... <laughs> Um, my rendition of The Call of Cthulhu, kind of an audio book mixed with us doing this podcast. Yeah, we, we I'll respond to it and, and we'll have little discussions throughout the text as you read it. And uh, Poe will snore on our laps. And we are excited about doing a series of those with maybe some uh, Edgar Allan Poe, some more Lovecraft stuff, and we can share some of our favorite copyright free uh, stories. <laughs> some creepy pasta or spooky spaghetti, if you will. Mm -hmm. so, th so that'll be beautiful and we also have uh, movie watch alongs and some um, s different mini-sode series coming up soon uh, go check it out patreon.com uh, very exciting and we want to give special thanks to the folks already supporting us over there especially Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike Alex Nakutis, Ryan Regan and Christy Atchison thank you guys we love you very much See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe. Music by Kyle Ryan. You can find Kyle at his YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. This has been a production of Longboy Media. <laughs>